to um, speak in this session if they want to come up up front to make the transitions faster? No. Who's in charge of this stuff? Who's running this show? Anybody who's in charge here? Thank you. I don't. I still don't think it's it's turned on. What's that? It's got a green light. Yes. Um, so there are a few people in this room who have been asked to speak during this sec section. Um, if you want to facilitate the process and come up and sit closer to the front now, um, that would be strategic. The less people talk, the more they can hear me. Ooh, how's that one work? Mm -hmm. I don't know who's in charge. Feel free to get up and talk to the video guys. I tried this one, I tried that one, I tried this one. All right. It's just turned way down. No? No? Hey? Hey! You can't hear me? You can hear me. It's not working in the room. It's turned too, too far down. Sorry to be forceful. It's amplified? I'm eating it and I can hardly hear myself. Um, all right, so there are a few people in this room who've been asked um, if they would be willing to get up and say a few things. Um, so those people know who they are and if they would like to get up to the... Okay. Thank you. I think that's much better. Um, there's, sit, sit closer to the front row. That would be great. I, we can sort of call you up one by one. Um, say you guys in the back over there that know you're on and you're sitting in the back. Just saying. All right. So um, this, this uh, section was a, a design to get uh, commentary, critique, uh, feedback, etc., from um, sort of a broad spectrum of, of thoughtful and somewhat uh, reputed people in the, in the broader community. Um, I'm not sure how to say that more specifically. People of some notoriety. Um, you might have heard of them. Um, and you will probably want to talk to them after you hear them. Um, um, so, yeah, the idea here was that, you know, you got to see those of us who have been actively engaged in this process over the past year plus, um, and now uh, we are giving you an opportunity to hear from people in the broader community about their thoughts. So, um, I was going to have Lisa get us started. Um, and then uh, I guess I've got my hit list, so we'll just call you up. Nice. Thanks for the reference. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Stokey. Um, I'm founder and executive director of a brand new organization called Next7.org. The Next7 is a reference to um, uh, the great law of peace uh, from the Iroquois that says in every deliberation we must think about the impact on the next seven generations, right? Not just the next seven years or seven days or seven weeks or whatever, next seven generations, right? So that's really long-term thinking. So, you know, in a, in a nutshell, that's why I'm really excited about, you know, what uh, has been initiated uh, here today and is being uh, launched and thought through with all of, you know, the amazing you know, people here that are, you know, here to engage. Um, Dan also asked me to give a little bit of background about my, my work, which gives some uh, context, I guess, for me standing here right now. Um, I am also, I'm a co-founder of an organization called Food Democracy Now. And I started this um, from Iowa, where I was born and raised. And if you know anything about Iowa, we have a whole lot of um, genetically engineered crops there and a lot of pesticides and uh, also a lot of health issues too, just incidentally. Um, we've done a lot of work on labeling with genetically engineered foods. We were you know, critical um, in the ballot initiatives across the country um, and winning, winning bills, uh, you know, like here in the Northeast. And at one point we had 26 states um, that had bills submitted, you know, for GMO labeling. Um, we've also done, you know, testing on glyphosate. If, if any of you have, have seen any testing on glyphosate in foods and the levels of that, that was, that was our organization that did that in partnership with the Detox Project. 
Um, so, you know, that's, I, I come from that perspective and working on, you know, federal policy, you know, some state policy, you know, to help, um, uh, you know, develop more of this um, base for sustainable agriculture and also, um, you know, I specifically on genetically engineered crops and deregulation and regulation and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it is with, you know, that background that I come, that I come to this. And there's been a lot of questions, you know, people saying, well, what about testing, you know, for the toxins? And, of course, you know, we now have those testings for the glyphosate, for example. Of course, we've been able to test for genetically engineered foods. And, you know, to some degree, we've been able, we've been able to do this, you know, to affect the marketplace, you know, that, um, you know, people are now looking for non-GMO and so on and so forth. But I'll say, you know, from, an, from, from my perspective as an organizer, and as an, as an advocate and an activist, um, you know, really quite full-time plus now for a while, that what started to really coalesce in my mind, you know, was really a reference, you know, to, you know, uh, uh, Bucky Fuller's comment, or his famous quote, where he said, you know, that you never change things by fighting, you know, the existing model, right? To change things, you make that existing model obsolete. Right? You build something new. <laughs> so that's, that's what I feel is, is being done here today. I feel like we really do need that deep, you know, collaboration. And not that policy is not important. Not that, you know, saying, saying, saying no, right, to what we don't want to see in our world, which of course is more pesticides. I'm not saying that those things are not key, but um, it takes a tremendous amount of energy, you know, to do these things, to fight. It takes so much more energy to fight, in, in my experience. So I would like to, you know, open that up, you know, to the broader public and through my organization of Next7 and to my community, you know, to say, let's, let's put that energy into building, you know, a new model, a new system. You know, I feel like if you create something that people gravitate towards, as opposed to what they don't want, it's so much more powerful, you know, of what we can create together. And then we truly do make that, that old model obsolete. So, I'm sorry. Do you have a few last name again? Stokey, S-T-O-K-K-E. -K -K -E. Thank you for asking. <laughs> nice job, Lisa. Uh, my name is Mark Mariah. Um, Dan gave me about 30 minutes notice that he wanted me to say something, so. Uh, what I want to do is actually um, give you a definition of networking that addresses some of the questions I think that were in the audience towards the end of the session this morning. Uh, and my, Because my definition of networking fits beautifully with the way we approach farming, at least in this room, and that is I define networking as putting people together for their mutual benefit. And because we're at a soil conference, I would add, and the benefit of what? The soil, thank you. What was the other word? The earth, yeah. So when I, and I'm going to challenge, this is a call to action. Dan knows that I've been only asking about calls to action since January of this year. Um, and I'm going to actually issue a call to action to each of you. What connection can you make? Each of you in this room, what connection can you make, introduction can you make, that would be to the benefit of the soil? So, you know, that can be anything. So we talked at lunch, and I would love to get some feedback from the audience if we have time on what have been some of your either chief takeaways, if you have them, or what is the action that you've decided to take or have already taken? In Nelia's case, she's already made an introduction to me that's actually a resource for BFA uh, in terms of to the press for public radio, or, no, for public television. But... What is your chief takeaway? What is the action step that you've already decided to take or maybe already taken that you'd be willing to share with us as an audience either right now or whenever it would be appropriate? That's what the next section of the, today's event is about. Okay. So, yes. So right I, want you to, I want you to really be thinking about that as we go through this. Um, the, and you already heard me say this earlier. I would like to eliminate the word farmer and producer from this conference for the next three days. Is anyone willing to do that with me? Just show of hands. It doesn't have to be everybody. This is optional. All right. What are we going to use instead? Gardeners. Great. What else? Health care hero. 
And if you don't, and if you don't like that, I'm okay with that. If you don't want to use that, how about healthcare worker? How about primary healthcare worker? What's more fundamental? If I could, I live in Colorado. Uh, we're pretty crazy about soil there too. Um, but if I could create 50,000 jobs in Colorado, it would be 50,000 primary healthcare workers in the state of Colorado who understand what many of you know and understand right now. And if we can do that, then we start to actually work. I love the quote from Buckminster Fuller. I totally relate to that. I've used it four times before I got here on the plane with a colleague that I came here with. But if we can do that, then we start to change the conversation. And if we in this room don't, aren't prepared to change our language around it, who? Who's going to change it? So that would be my challenge to you, is to start thinking in terms of there are no farmers in this room anymore. There are healthcare heroes. If that's too extreme, how about healthcare workers, primary healthcare workers? Because if you really think about it that way, the immune system is absolutely in charge of making us healthy. Well, what's the first immune system we have to worry about? Soil. Because before it gets in my stomach, it's got to be in the soil. I saw a hand raised. Absolutely. I love that. Soil. <laughs> did anyone hear that? Soil whisperer. Anything but farmer or, or, right, or producer. <clears throat> Those words aren't descriptive of what people who are doing this work really are impacting. So yeah, absolutely. Soil whisperer. All right, Mark. Would be great. Thank you. Oh, that's all I have. Yeah, that was a yeah. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. Well, I, yeah. We're gonna do. We're gonna do. Uh, yes. And Mark will never tell you this, but he was, you know, almost single-handedly responsible for this event uh, occurring, this whole conference. So there's a, there's a story back behind that. But, um, <clears throat> And I, I will say now, which I didn't say before, that the, what I invited people to do was to spend one to two minutes on who you are and where you come from, which you skipped. Um, <laughs> and one to two minutes on, on your comments. So that's the formal framing. You got the important part. Yeah, you got the... Julie, you want to go next? There's a, there's a mic over there on the yeah, podium. I'm Julie Rawson and I am a farmer and I'm proud to be a farmer. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> um, I'm also Dan's mother, if you didn't know that already. But anyway, I um, am the executive director of the Northeast Organic Farming Association, Massachusetts chapter, and have been involved with NOVA since 1984 and also run with my husband and family and extended friends and such, um, Mini Hands Organic Farm in Barry, Mass. So been we we are in that organic movement um been certified since 1987 but my role in nofa i think has been always to push the envelope um a little farther than just organic and not beyond organic maybe but um enhanced organic or organic plus or whatever you already want to say so one of the things that we've been doing a lot in nofa mass <clears throat> for the last almost four years now is working on carbon and uh, how that, how we as producers, whether we are gardeners or farmers or homesteaders or landscapers, can uh, most effectively and quickly and efficiently uh, improve the carbon sequestration uh, capabilities of our soils. And I don't know where she is. She's around here somewhere. But um, Christine Jones has been one of our mentors, and a lot of other people like Graham Sate and. Uh, a lot of other folks who are, have been in this movement for a while. Um, so that's really uh, what we are about in NOFA. And we do a lot of different things. We're a local organic farming organization. Um, but we do, um, carbon is very important to us. And so food quality happens to go hand in hand with carbon. And so that's why I get along with Dan so well. Um, <laughs> and so um, I guess what, um, the second question was what? <laughs> general commentary. What well, we're general up to commentary. Here. I'm very excited about um, organizations like NOFA. Um, everybody's always like, oh, let's talk to the farmers. You know, let's get those farmers. And we, it's very exciting to be the, um, the uh, representative sample of the people that our people are always trying to get in touch with. But 
I would like to get NOFA Mass really involved with um, Farm OS and you know as soon as the tool is ready have that involvement too and really um, get us really moving um, to get uh, lots and lots of people who are agricultural producers using these systems and working with Dorn. So, um, and I would love to um, consider being one of those um, farm hubs on our farm too. Thanks, Julie. Strelnick? <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. Hi, everybody. This is fun. It's a challenge. <laughs> I always bring Chi Chi. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a short story. Um, oh, are you, are you wrong? It's coming. It's coming. It's part of the story. <laughs> but thank you. Um, and I hope the story will be validating and provocative so that we can all keep learning. All right? Um, uh, happy to elaborate on any of this if useful with examples and whatever. You can give me to talk way too much. All right? um, my name is David Strelnick, S T R E L N E C K. Thank you. Um, I, I spent about 25 years designing environmental initiatives around the world. I've worked on the ground in about 34 countries and worked with entrepreneurs in another 30 or 40. Um, that's what I do. I'm a social scientist. I'm an economist. I tackle messy environmental problems and try to figure out technological, economic, behavioral, political solutions. That's, 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 so that's where I'm coming from. The, the, the story I want to tell in brief is just that, um, and this is my commentary, I think, I just hope it's interesting, is that, uh, I guess it's a question. What happens if you work with the world's leading social entrepreneurs, uh, which is part of what I do? So people who've been recognized globally as system changing social entrepreneurs in society. People have come up with completely new ways of doing things in the world that change paradigms. Um, wherever you are in the world, big or small. Um, I have the honor and the privilege of being able to do that and have for about 15 years. I work in part with a group called Ashoka that uh, coined the term social entrepreneur 30 years ago and set out to create a field of work called social entrepreneurship. Right? And uh, it's going pretty well. What happens if you work with, with anybody in, 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 in that network, around 80 countries, uh, highly vetted people who've done something systemic that shifted how their society works, and you look for the basis of the value that they've managed to create somehow that, they're, that they've built their enterprise on, their business or their social enterprise? Because you can't sustain something if there isn't some value being created somehow, right? So what happens if you work with these folks, if you work with the elephant protectionist in Zambia, the poet in Western Ireland, the uh, health insurance company in Boston, Massachusetts, who's decided to invest in the food system of the companies they insure because they realize that those companies start cashing in a lot less frequently on their health insurance policies when their staff stay healthy to begin with. What happens if you work with these kinds of people and you try to say, where, what's the base? Is there a pattern in what they're doing? Of course there is, that's why I'm standing here. Uh, so fast forward, we've been doing that for about 10 years. Uh, at, we were asked specifically to focus on rural innovations in about 30 countries. So find the roots of systemic rural innovations, things that were working. Uh, from Mohammed Yunus, who invented microfinance, who's one of our friends, et cetera. Okay, the end of the story is, here's the conclusion, and this is what I work on now, in part, uh, what you end up doing is telling the world, wanting to tell the world that they need to invent a handheld mini mass spectrometer that measures nutrient spectrum in food. Yes. Specifically. Okay? I'll send you a presentation. I, because of that story, I was invited to chair the nutrition panel at the World Food Prize in the Borlaug Dialogue about three years ago. Yeah. Um, not that I knew anything about nutrition, but I knew, I knew why I said what I just said. And so uh, my point is that what we found is that systemic innovators around the world 
who built successful social or business enterprises were tapping the nutritional relationship between the earth and people and all the benefits that result. The, the environmental benefits, the water, the carbon, the elephant conservation, the, the food security in places of the world where people literally starve to death if they don't make it through the dry season. How are these people creating these enterprises? What they're doing is they're tapping and somehow capturing the value and monetizing the benefits that come out of doing everything you're talking about doing here. And they managed to build their enterprises around it. So we flipped that around. We launched a new organization, which I'm the director of now, called Nourish to the Nth Degree. Nourish, N. N is the connection between nutrients, nutrition, and nourishment cycles in society. Where we're out trying to, to spread the models, the initiatives, the examples that we've come up with, the data, um, and to inspire additional local people everywhere to see the value opportunities that are sitting in front of them because of because of these nu nutrient cycle relationships, and to, to, to build new ways of doing things around those. So, thanks for the opportunity to, to say you. that, and, <laughs> and thanks for everything you're doing. Usually I'm in places where nobody has any clue what I'm talking about, so this is like totally cool. I'm like, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's what he said. Okay, I am Dr. Elaine Ingham, and I work with soil microorganisms, so I know a great deal about how Mother Nature cycles nutrients and makes those nutrients available back to plants. Um, one of the things um, that kind of caught my ear this morning was when somebody started talking about working with the dirt. Dirt. Come on, guys. What's the difference between soil and dirt? Life and organic matter. Dirt is just the sand, sail, clay, rocks, and pebbles. We have all the nutrients that we require in the sand, the silt, the rocks, the pebbles. There is absolutely no reason to put mineral nutrients back into the dirt because they're already there. We have more than enough to grow any plant we want to grow. They're not available. Exactly. How do you make the nutrients which are present in your soil, in your dirt? So I probably should say it that way. It's in your dirt. How do you make those nutrients available? It's called bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, earthworms. You got to get the good guys, not the bad guys. And the things that make certain that we're going to have the beneficial organisms present is to keep it aerobic. So how does that relate to the gizmo? that we were learning about this morning. Well, we have to know that we have the proper biology in that soil to make those nutrients available to plants, to protect your root systems and the above ground part of your plant so it can be healthy. You know, Mother Nature ha has the disease causers, the pests, the problem organisms are there for a reason. It's called garbage collecting. And so when your plant gets diseased, when it gets sick, when it's not healthy, Mother Nature's going to send in those problem organisms. We don't kill them. We have to listen to the message that's being sent. We've got to figure out what's missing in your soil. And so the major challenge that we really have in terms of getting healthy ecosystems is to figure out what's missing in your soil and get those organisms back into that soil. So how do you do that easily? How do you do that simply? Well, you'll have to come to my talk tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Cliffhanger here. But I am so excited about the gizmo because if we can really establish what that relationship is between whatever it is we're going to measure in that plant material, and this has got to be surface, because when we shine the gizmo at that apple, what is it exactly that we should be measuring? And it has to be that material that's in the surface. So we've we got to figure out what that thing is that we got to measure in the beets and the carrots and the salads, uh, the you know the um, celery, the cilantro, the apples, the pears, the peaches. There's some work to be done, as we obviously understand. But what's the real driver here? 
everybody on this planet is concerned about the value, the nutrition in their food. And so now we're going to have a gizmo. And we can shine this on our food and go, oh, that's not worth buying. Ugh. How about this apple over here? Is that worth buying? Oh, no, it doesn't have the nutrients. That, okay, which nutrients is it exactly? Got to work that out. But we're going to choose by, we're going to win because it's people's dollars buying food, buying the nutrition. So which apple am I going to buy? I'm going to buy the apple that has the best nutrition in it. Do you think that's a little bit of a driver to make certain that we get the proper biology back into the soil so all the nutrients your plants require, all that disease protection Let's build structure in the soil so the root systems on those so, um, plants go down as deep as possible so you don't have to have irrigation. Because if the root systems go down to 10, 20, 25 feet that they're supposed to go down, you don't have to worry about water. The water is going to be stored in that soil. It's going to be available to your plants. So many of the problems that we have in the world of agriculture go away once we start to understand what the biology can do for you in the soil. And I want the gizmo. <laughs> a ringing endorsement. Yes. <laughs> I want a thousand of those. <laughs> Mr. Montgomery? Yeah, hurry up. <laughs> We're out of time. Um, fortunately, I'm a professor, so that's not a problem. <laughs> uh, I'm Dave Montgomery. I'm a geology professor at the University of Washington, and I write books on the side. Uh, one, the first one I wrote about soil is called Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations. Then Ann and I wrote The Hidden Half of Nature, and The Growing Revolution just came out. And in it, we sort of ca deal with our learning about the importance of soil to civilization as its foundation and the lessons that we can learn from past civilizations that have not heeded the importance of regenerating their soil. Right on through the kind of stuff that Elaine helped teach us about and that Christine's worked on in terms of the role of soil life in uh, maintaining fertility to how farmers can actually apply that in the real world in growing a revolution. The piece that Anne and I think really found sort of missing from a lot of the studies and the data and the literature that we've been reviewing as, on the course of all that research and reading was how to directly connect soil health to human health. We've talked about it since Lady Eve Balfour uh, and Sir Albert Howard. Um, and if you go back and look at the literature, there's not a lot of studies that have been able to connect all the way through in one go. We've got to break it up into those little bits. We have to do a little bit of reduction of science. But connecting that thread is the book that Anne and I are trying to work on now. So. I'm really excited about the idea of, as Elaine called it, the gizmo, um, the handheld spectrometer uh, for, I like gizmo. for yeah. grocery store applications. Yeah. There's got to be a horrible acronym in there somewhere. We'll, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the thing that gave me optimism in writing Growing a Revolution was the idea that regenerative farming practices can save farmers money today, that there's short-term economic incentives that for, the, for one of the first times in history are lining up with society's long-term interest in maintaining and rebuilding the fertility of the soil. That's a true potential game changer. But the brutal truth is not everybody cares about the soil. I mean, we may not want to admit that in this room, <laughs> but almost everybody cares about their health or the health of their kids or the health of the people that they love. And being able to actually have something at the consumer point of purchase that gives you the ability to make that judgment for yourself of, are these orga is this organic produce really as good as the label would tend to imply? Is that conventional stuff as bad as we might think it is? What about the farmer who's completely off the grid, who's growing the incredible stuff, but refuses to be labeled by anybody's other opinion of him or her? The power for the consumer to make those choices for him or herself could be a real game changer. And as I tried to lay out in Growing a Revolution, rethinking our relationship to the soil could be a real game changer for humanity for the next 100 or 200 years. Um, so I probably burned my two minutes up there, but that's... Well, but, well okay, okay, good. Yeah. So that means I can uh, stop and there'll be a quiz later. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Is it on? Yeah. Yep, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sara from Finland. 
I think I'm, I don't know if there's anyone else here from abroad. Yes. yes. No, not many other Europeans. But, okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe only European, at least only Scandinavian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, actually, Elaine, Christine, uh, David and Anne and Ray, you, I don't think you know that you have a fan club in Finland. I, I, I'm, I'm serious. I attended, many people have asked me, what brought you here? It's like, well, the topic, the gizmo, and the topic in, in general, and then the speaker list. So, I'm not kidding. I have to take pictures to people in Finland, and I actually, you know, I've been here with these people. And it's really, um, it's really battery charging for me to be here, because I also have to do a lot of, uh, a lot more worse discussions about soil and health and environment. We have the producers union, but it's not gardeners union at, at least in Finland. <laughs> so this really gives me strength. Well, um, about me, what do I do? Um, I have co-founded a foundation uh, for Baltic Sea and Climate Work, and we have just started a carbon action called project. It's um, gardener to gardener mentoring. Uh, research uh, of different methods. Um, scientists are attending it, uh, modeling and verification parts. And then we have the first uh, 100 carbon farmers of Finland there. We call them climate and Baltic Sea heroes, but they could be called also the healthcare heroes. So maybe they're climate, Baltic Sea, and healthcare heroes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am a co founder of two companies. One is called Soil Food, and I'm so glad that I don't have to tell you here why it is called the Soil Food, as you just described it. Uh, we produce soil amendments, organic soil amendments, and biological boosters, how to support the biology. Um, other, one, other companies produce biomethane with the help of microbes, so microbes as well there. Uh, I have two own demonstration farms. One is the oldest one in Finland, and um, we have big test plots, and we're creating more with this carbon and biodiversity uh, testing and research issues. Um, this conference, well, it was worth coming. I don't know what else can I say. It has been worth already. I like the discussions. I will bring home a lot of arguments, a lot of good, good new things. It sort of like closes the loop in, in this area where I work with. I don't have to argue about that. So. And it's always worth expanding the network. I like being, I really like being here. I wish, yeah, just come, come, come to say hello to me. And just if you ever feel like coming to Finland, just let me know. We have very good demonstration farms. But come, come when it's summer. Okay. <laughs> Um, um, yeah. Hi, my name is Rich, and I'm addicted to minerals. <laughs> Have been since I was born. Uh, gizmo is either uh, geological idiosyncrasy, soils, minerals, and oils, or it's good imaging of uh, my minerals, oils, and soils. first time I ever spoke publicly, I had to go home uh, right back to the room and change my pants because they were quite soiled. Elaine was the topic at the Acres in 2005. And I said, what's an Elaine? And they go, no, that's a person looking at poop and soil and stuff. I'm like, wow, what's that got to do with anything? That's how little I knew when I got into this because I've been a chiropractor for 38 years and I didn't really understand this relationship. And the first time I met Dan, um, he listened to me give my first speech and he comes up to me afterwards and says, I'm going to mineralize the world. Do you have any money to help? And I said, what are we smoking right now? <laughs> What's in this pipe that you think I've got lots of money to give you? When I seen him in Time Magazine, I literally laughed. I called up, I said, my secretary, she got to look at this. This guy that said he was going to mineralize the world has got a gizmo. <laughs> and he's in Time Magazine. I says, he's actually doing it. And I called him right up and we talked for a little bit. And uh, so for 38 years, I've been... Wakening up, uh, 1981, I went into the third hall of records off the coast of Aruba and came out and have been writing ever since. Um, I wrote my back to God. I got hooked up with Chuck Walters, wrote the book Minerals for the Genetic Code, 
Before we died, we wrote a second book called Minerals for Tumor Suppressing Genes, which you'll never see the light of day due to the current life expectancy of alternative doctors. <laughs> I'm here to tell you I'm not depressed and I don't want to jump out of the third story building or have my airplane crash. <laughs> yeah, that fan on the airplane, it's a fan because it quits, I sweat. I tell you what, on the way here, I thought they had me because my I get out of bed at 3 and I'm supposed to be at the airport for a 5 o'clock flight and, you know, email comes across, no airplane. 7 o'clock, uh, 7 o'clock comes, no airplane. 11 o'clock comes, no airplane. I go to the airport and I walk in and virtually the people that are running, the, you know, everything there, they're patients of mine. I said, am I the only person on the airplane? And they go, yep. I go, they got me right where they want me. <laughs> And I get on the airplane, and there's a stewardess, and there's a nice big Boeing airplane. And the guy and I said, I'm a pilot. He says, oh, boy, we're going to have fun. So they're sitting at the second longest runway in the United States up in Alpena, and they floor this thing with the brakes on. And when you let go of the brakes, it throws you back at the seat. At the end of the runway, we were 6,000 feet. <laughs> I mean, they floored it and took off. It was quite it's like a shuttle ride. <laughs> so yeah, the first book was, this, in the second book I mentioned, Everybody comes up and says, why don't you write a book we can read? So I do. <laughs> so I, I, I really adore doing house calls to the Amish because it's a good cash job. They don't like their pictures and I don't like making the records. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so I realized at the eighth grade education level that their nutrition education is zero. So I wrote a book that any eighth grader could read. And it's not on the internet because Amish don't have computers. It's called an Amishman's Handy Guide to Minerals, Vitamins, and Food Supplements. It's a thousand-page doorstop full of beautiful colors produced by Ruben Stelfus from uh, Lancaster Egg. So that didn't like it. This book that I started writing is called Minerals for Acupuncture Meridian, which is the flow of weak magnetic energy in the body. And I'll be releasing that at this conference. But it's not a book you can have me sign. It's an e-book. And then the second book I'm releasing tomorrow is a book about everything in the brain and spinal column, which is called cerebral spinal fluid. So the, the University of Calgary was given $90 million and says, go buy machines in the United States that can tell us anything about everything. And when they analyze cerebral spinal fluid, there are 42 minerals in it. Every mineral that I suggested was going to be in the human body is found in the brain. I go, shit, I gotta write a book about this. And then the second book I'm writing right now is the second most abundant mineral in your brain, which is a dear mineral to organic farmers, is boron. And there is so little known about boron, I'm going to write a book about that. Now, what I'm asking questions about minerals in the gizmo, uh, the good imaging of minerals, soils, and oils, you got, you know, the, the question was, well, what about, you know, we've got a watermelon. Well, where's all the minerals? It's on the peels of potatoes. It's on the peels of your but carrots. It's on the peels of everything. So if one-third of the human genetic code is mineral-based, why not have something that gives you the mineral content so we can at least get an idea if you're going to be able to operate one-third of your genetic code? Is vitamin A necessary? Yeah, but what are vitamins there for? To absorb minerals. Just go to calcium and find out how many genes. There's 2,900. How many zinc? There's 4,000 of them. There's 7,000 phosphorus. So if somebody said to me I could give you a gizmo that would give me the mineral content, and I don't mean NPK, you know, give me some weird, obscure trace minerals if that are, they're going to be in there. You know you're not going to have some type of uh, glyphosate inhibitor in there. Uh, I think this could revolutionize where the dollars flow in conventional farmers would then have to give their houses back to the banks to satisfy the loans. Or they'll do like they do in India when the GMO crops go, they kill themselves. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Richard. Richard, don't worry, ladies and gentlemen. Christine, you up? Or not? No? Yeah, all right. Uh, my name's Christine Jones. That was a hard act to follow. Um, I obviously speak a different language, I'm sorry, because I didn't understand half of that. <laughs> and uh, you probably won't understand half of what I'm saying, because um, Jack Dan's dad says she talks funny. <laughs> um, 
I have a PhD in soil biochemistry and um, I just wanted to say something about data and data collection that if you do something like uh, a major course of study in something, you, you, you begin with a, a hypothesis that you're going to test and you go out and you begin collecting data. And the more data you collect, the more data you realise that you need to collect. And at the end of, and you keep changing the topic or changing the way you do the research and it's, it's an ongoing thing. In fact, it probably lasts for the rest of your life. Uh, just wondering about things. Every time you, or if you do get an answer to the question, it, it raises another question. But it generates some extraordinary insights. You never actually know what the end point is going to be when you begin to do something. Uh, somebody sets down uh, a proposal to do a PhD and they outline what they're going to do in three years of research or whatever it may be. And you could almost guarantee that by the time they get to the end of that thesis, it looks nothing like what it was that they set out to do. So my point about this having a device that's going to be in the hands of many people is that we can have an enormous amount of data generated that wasn't possible to be generated before. And it's going to create insights into questions that we haven't asked yet. And, and new possibilities open new horizons. I think it's very exciting to, to be entering this age of where we do have um, technology available to us that, that hasn't been previously um, available. We, we can intuit a lot of uh, the correlations between soil health, uh, the nutritional value of food, human health, climatic health, landscape function, uh, all of those things, uh, the regenerative ag movement, the soil health movement, um, the, the emphasis on food quality for nutritional aspects, for health, human health aspects. I mean, we're moving pretty quickly now on all of those fronts, but we don't really have the technology to keep up with where it is that we want to go. And so from that aspect, for the, from the point of view of it being open source as well, that it be a multi, uh, you know, have as many people involved as possible, I, I guess my issue would be how do we handle all the data that we, we've got, I mean, we've got robots that are smarter than us now, uh, robots and, and um, I use that word to mean artificial intelligence really, R robot wasn't the right word. The thing that worries me with artificial intelligence is that it might <laughs> take over the world and start telling us what to do. I mean, my, you know, your car already tells you what to do when you haven't turned off the, uh, turned off the lights or removed the key or you haven't got your seatbelt on or, you know, don't you hate it when it's beeping at you because you haven't put your seatbelt on yet, uh, all those sorts of things. So we have artificial intelligence already. Um, I think we need to step one, keep one step ahead of artificial intelligence, but I'm, I'm uh, deviating from the topic now. Um, the point being that data, I guess is what we've always said, isn't it, about models and computer programs and that sort of thing. It's only, the answer that you get is only as good as the information that you put into it. And that we probably have to think about how we're going to handle all that information. But I do see the potential for a very, very powerful tool. And as I said, it will create new insights and answer questions that we probably haven't asked yet. And just to give a very, uh, a, an example from something that we already do use, uh, there's quite a lot of farmers in the regenerative ag space using refractometers to measure the BRICS level um, of what they're producing, which tells you basically uh, how much sugar is in the plant, how much mineral is in the plant, and therefore provides an indicator of the sorts of things that Elaine was talking about, like how well is that soil food web, that soil microbiome functioning in order to make those minerals available. I agree with you totally that the minerals are there in our soils. When people start talking about adding minerals, they go, what do you think soil is made from? Soil is made from minerals. That's what the dirt part of it is. <laughs> and we have to activate those with life in the soil and we can measure how well that activation is proceeding by how the, the uh, mineral levels that we have in, in the plants, which bricks will give us a pretty good indication of that. But by measuring bricks, simple as it is, we have obtained a whole lot of information about uh, the immune responses of plants, their ability to deal with pests and diseases. Um, we see extraordinary things happen as BRICS levels are increased. We also see amazing things in terms of animal health. Higher BRICS in plants will always produce higher growth rates in animals, will produce higher milk production or higher production of whatever it is that you are producing. 
and healthier animals. So we can, even with a very simple measure like that, we can see all kinds of correlations um, from the soil, through the plants, through the animals, and also it's linked to landscape function and climate change, of course, because all of those things are intrinsically linked. So I think when we have more information and a model and a device that can provide more information that we get now from a refractometer, I think it could be very powerful uh, for the future. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Adrian Hyde, uh, the executive director of uh, Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Jersey. And uh, how did I get here? Um, so it was, um, I've always been a, a pretty um, active environmentalist, and I got into agriculture by way of environmentalism. Um, my wife and I were involved in a lot of things, fighting fracking in New York, starting a recycling thing in Arizona. Uh, working on the ocean plastics issue, and, and we learned a lot of things along the way. But like everybody in this room, you know, we're all the type of people who ask why and how, and we keep pulling on those threads. And ultimately, when you start pulling on those threads, they often lead back to agriculture and back to how we, you know, care for the soil. And so, you know, that's what got me into agriculture. Uh, so I, I also am a uh, healthcare practitioner, um, uh, certified organic in New Jersey. Um, and, uh, you know, in my role at NOFA, fortunately, I don't really have to be good at anything because there are plenty of people around me who are good at it. So my job is to really connect you all with um, the people that uh, aren't yet kind of up to speed with what it is that we're talking about. So that's what I see as my most important um, responsibility. And so I, I often spend my time thinking about... Um, you know, how is it that we reach more people? How is it that we get outside of our bubble, right? Because everybody here, we're all, we're all in. We're doing this. We're, we're out there actually doing it. And um, I, I see kind of um, two really big barriers, uh, one of which is, is, is more recent, um, one of which has been around a little bit longer. And they're both psychological things. And they're harder to talk about, and they're harder to figure out how to address them. And uh, this will ultimately tie back to what we're doing here today. But one big psychological issue is, you know, I call it the distance effect. You know, the way that we're practicing agriculture right now is out of sight, out of mind. Most people have never even seen a farm, right? And uh, so, and then also, it's not just a, a physical distance sometimes. Sometimes it's a, a metaphorical or a psychological distance where people aren't connected to how, how, the, how their food is produced and what all the, the side effects are. And, you know, economically, our market system uh, is, uh, there's a market failure in that the negative externalities and the positive externalities, depending upon which systems you're talking about, uh, they're, they're just not even in price. They're, they're not in there. And so it's a total market failure. So how do you, uh, how do you get, uh, and then, then a more recent thing I'd say in the last 20 years is that a lot of people were hearing things about the urgency of some of our environmental and ecological situations. And they were like, oh, they just didn't get the sense of urgency. They were concerned. They would read things in books and newspapers, and they'd get involved, and they'd be, oh, wow, this is really serious. But then, you know, they would get on with their daily lives, and convenience always won, right? And um, so what's happened, though, is that we've gone from people saying, oh, it's not urgent enough for me to change, not urgent enough, not urgent enough, not urgent enough, where immediately we flipped to it's hopeless. <laughs> right? There was, there was no springtime. Like, what was in between? There was, there, was, there was nothing there. And so, you know, these are the sorts of things that we need to contend with in order to get outside of our bubble and to have our message heard much more broadly. So what I really liked about um, the comments this morning is we kind of, in broad categories, covered two things. You know, one thing that Dan talked about is, is what I'm thinking of as the rules of engagement, and that is the sharing first culture. And really being, uh, and having a vocabulary, engagement is what we need to reach outside of our bubble. Then the tools of engagement, you know, Dorn talked about some of the tools of engagement. We have a lot of tools available to us now that we didn't have, you know, a certain, you know, number of years ago, even five years ago, ten years ago. We have new tools all the time. And uh, some of them are technology-based tools like Farm OS. 
Um, I think that the gizmo that we're referring to, that uh, to be named gizmo, um, love the fact people keep using the word gizmo. It's going to be. <laughs> it's going to be. Uh, it's going to really democratize uh, the, sh the sharing of knowledge around what it is we're talking about and put it in real terms for, for real people. Um, but one of the things that uh, seems to always work best for us, you know, back in New Jersey, are stories. Uh, so hopefully people will grab me, especially people from New Jersey, and tell me some stories. Tell me the stories about how you got into this, right? Because there's a lot of learning that comes from that, and people retell stories. And that's part of what, uh, you know, is behind the movement building. I'm really kind of obsessed with movement building. And if we're really going to get outside the bubble, we need to tell more stories. And so I've got one in my head. It's not even a good one, but I'll just tell you because it's, it's brand new, fresh. I mean, I have hundreds of them. And, uh, but, uh, you know, there's a guy that I know in my neighborhood. And, uh, you know, his, uh, he was just a regular person living in a suburban you know, subdivision. And his daughter really started getting into what we're talking about. She's a student of a few people here. And uh, so she kept telling, you know, her dad and mom about all these things, and they started getting interested little by little. Next thing you know, mom starts a little flower business. Next thing you know, she's growing some flowers on my farm because she didn't have a farm. And next thing you know, I'm talking to her about what we're talking about. And that's kind of how, and, and uh, just last week they closed on their farm, and they're pursuing the type of agriculture that we're looking at doing. And there are hundreds of stories like this, so hopefully people will um, recognize the importance of us getting outside of our bubble, and the way of doing that is through uh, engagement. And uh, some of the things that have worked really well for us at NOPA New Jersey are so basic. We do a book club, right? We do a book clubs throughout the state, and we pick our books carefully. Um, you would be surprised how many people who are doing what we're doing today are doing it because one day, 10 years ago, they read Omnivore's Dilemma. It's no joke. I know multiple people who started on the path that way, literally by reading a book. So hopefully uh, everyone will share those stories because these are things that can be replicated. Thank you. Give us your name again. Oh, sorry. I'm Adrian Hyde with NOFA, New Jersey. Ann? Oh, we can come up. It's okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were going to do it or not. All right. Hi. Uh, my name is Ken Whitman, and I, my background is uh, being a co-owner of a mineral a supplement company called Natural Vitality, and uh, our biggest product is called Natural Calm, which is the number one magnesium supplement in the natural product space. Uh, about 11 years ago, I started to wonder why there was a supplement business needed at all. And I did some reading and I started uh, researching and pulling down and at the end of it, I ended up in the soil. And I found out that the food that we are eating is minerally deficient and has been going, uh, becoming more and more minerally deficient year by year by year. Which is, of course, why one would need to take supplements in order to survive in this world and to provide your body with what it needs and is not getting from its diet. And at the same time, I found out that there, were, uh, there was an organization um, which was actually the, the parent organization of BFA uh, called Remineralize the Earth, and I became involved in, with that organization. And uh, at that time, Dan was the executive director. And shortly thereafter, uh, Dan decided to pursue the actual uh, farming and, and food aspect of, of this. And uh, there founded BFA. And uh, I'm proud to say that 
uh, our company uh, was the original um, founder and, and donor and supporter of, of this organization and has been uh, ever since. And uh, what really got me going is the dream, which Dan so beautifully articulated this morning when he, when he opened. Um, the dream was so exciting to me. I knew this is it. This is the most important thing. And for one particular reason, one word, I would say leverage. I have not uh, heard an idea that has leverage on changing this world that could compare to this dream. Uh, why? Because at the end of the day, I mean, why, why is the natural, uh, the natural products industry so hot? Why did it, you know, why is it the, the, one of the leading forces in, uh, in our country today? Because it relates to food, and food is intimate, and we all experience that at least three times a day, and you can't beat food for, for impact. And what, what this concept says is, okay, let's, let's fix it. Let's fix it at the source. Let's, let's, um, let's revolutionize agriculture. Let's do it the right way. And not only are we going to do it the right way, but the other part of the dream is let's measure it, right? We know, I mean, we don't have to have all the scientific evidence to know, you know, that something, when you, when you get a tomato that's fresh off the farm, grown in good soil with all of the necessary nutrients and so forth and enzymes and whatever, um, you bite into it and it's sweet. I mean, there's, you know it. You don't have to see a lab analysis to know that you, you're eating something that's really, really good for you, that's full of minerals, and that's where the taste comes from, the minerals. But, of course, not everybody knows that. So what do we need? We need to convince everyone else with some empirical evidence. So there's the meter, the gizmo, if you will. Um, and the idea that there could be one that the farmer could use, that he could, he or she could actually use it on site and get readouts that would, that would significantly help the process. Number one. Number two, the buyer at store level, the buyer at Whole Foods is receiving these goods but hasn't tasted them, hasn't analyzed them, and could easily go, hey, okay, well, this one, uh, not so good. This one, okay, I'm going to pay a premium for this one because I know that I can sell this one at a higher price. And as far as the customer goes, um, customer gets a little thing. I like to think of it like a battery tester, a really simple little thing that you can point at your produce that goes, you know, good, fair, excellent. And if it's excellent, you know, now you're talking about your health and the health of, of your family. Are you going to buy the fair one or are you going to spend a little bit more and buy the excellent one? So, I mean, the, I have told this story to uh, a lot of media over the last 11 years. And they are so excited about it. They just love it. It communicates. It's, it's brilliant. So, I guess... Um, other than the fact that I'm just absolutely thrilled to see that there's a conference like this with so many amazing attendees and so forth. I think this is just, just great. This is the, like a dream coming true. But um, I guess what I would say, uh, if I have a message, my message is simply that, uh, yeah, we've all got our specialties. And we all have our little niches, and we all have our things that we've focused on uh, during our lives, and we bring that to the table. But 
the future is we, we have to link up, we have to cooperate, we have to focus on something that we can agree upon. And there's tremendous power in that, big, big power. Uh, and the fact that this dream, uh, Dan has had the foresight to put it in the public domain, makes all the difference because it doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to each one of us and it belongs to all of us. So I guess what, what would be great to come out of this conference is, uh, is a real focus on how we can um, think, of it, think of it like a puzzle. Uh, and, and each one of us is like, is the puzzle piece. And when we put that puzzle together, we create a new landscape and a new picture and a new energy that um, this world needs. And, and I think that this could be the, the genesis of something really, really huge. So thank you. Okay. I think Ken didn't quite, maybe he made the point, but without him, the BFA would not exist. Uh, so thank you very much, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> we got two people left, we're a little bit over time. I wanted to keep moving the ball forward. I get, had given people four minutes, um, and some of them respected that boundary, but not everyone did. Uh, and <laughs> it's all good. Okay, I, I will try to respect the, no, sorry, the time thing. No, it, it's fine. <laughs> So let's see. My, okay, who who am I? My name is Ann Bickley. I'm here from Seattle, Washington, and the author of a book out there called "The Hidden Half of Nature: The Microbial Roots of Life and Health," which I'll be doing a talk on tomorrow. And so that's a little bit there. But I really have to tell you who I really am. I am a completely out of bounds biologist. I started uh, in natural history. I was a total kind of birds and bees and plants gal. And I never ever thought I'd take much of an interest in um, tiny things, tiny things like microorganisms, until I began doing research for the hidden half of nature. And I will tell you, uh, if you come to the talk tomorrow, um, I promise to blow your mind with the microbial world, okay? Um, and I also have quite a bad case of, I don't know if it's a disease or not, but a bad case of plant lust. And if you, if you come to our house in Seattle, you'll, you'll see what I mean. But the thing about a bad case of plant lust is that it makes you think and it makes you really curious about how the world works. And one of the things as an out-of-bounds biologist that I've had the privilege of doing is my career has, has sort of taken a, a snake-like path. And I did a foray into the public health field um, about five six years ago. And one of the things that I found so fascinating about that field, I had come from salmon restoration, where all we talked about all the time was habitat and food and what are the living conditions for these salmon populations in the Northwest. And it was always very clear, at least to, to my colleagues and I, the problem in, in large part with salmon, at least um, with river systems, is that we were wrecking the habitat. They did not have good places to spawn. They didn't have adequate food supplies and so on and so on. And then when I got into public health, I saw these parallels. I, and one of them was diet. And one of them uh, was that when I learned about epidemic proportions of diseases in children, I was pretty shocked. When I learned that seven of 10 adults in America die prematurely from some type of chronic disease, I thought, wow. We're sort of like salmon, but the conditions are a little different and the causes are a little different. So that really got my mind going on health. And what I think is so neat about the Gizimoto, that's what I want to call it, um, uh, uh, is that I see it as a way to connect agricultural policy with health policy. Because right now, those are two arenas in our country that are completely broken and need to be thrown out and we need to start all over. And I think what needs to be at the top of many of our policies is health, right? 
we are in the modern world that so many of us are as sick as we are, and especially children, is just not right. Our ag policy needs to be health policy, our transportation policy, our energy policy, all of this needs to be geared up and focused on health. And so I think the gizmo is a great way to get agriculture on the right path. And um, I also want to say that tomorrow, speaking of health, long ago, right, we never had agrochemical companies and we never had pharmaceutical companies. We had our bodies, we had where we lived, and we had what we ate. And so tomorrow, I'm going to talk with you about why your colon is not a garbage can, people. Your colon is an onboard medicine chest if you feed it nutrient-dense foods, okay? There is a lot of pharmaceutical action happening in our colons right now, especially after that lunch. I mean, there's a lot of fermentation potentially happening in all of us right now. <laughs> and a lot of communication with our immune system. So this is why you know, food and agriculture and how we treat the land is intimately connected with our health and our bodies. And then uh, lastly, yeah, and, and I, I'm an explainer person. I like, I like connecting things, I like explaining things, I like science and I like history. And I think the whole effort here in, today and in the coming days is an attempt to sort of rectify where humanity has sort of gone off from what we know in our hearts and in our guts with what it is we ought to be doing with respect to agriculture. And Dave reminded me, since he talked a long time, he said, I forgot to ask. So we are working on a new book, and when Dan said this morning these dots are hard to connect, Dave and I are determined to connect these dots and build the evidence base for what is going to be happening here in the next coming days. And although science is reductionist, what you can take are these big points of reduction and you can string them together and you can explain things and you can, can connect things. So to that end, we are, David and I are looking for um, farmers who maybe have been poking around in their own fields, their own soil, their own farms, and taking some measurements and comparing them with, you know, over the fence. Hey, what's the neighbor's stuff like? So uh, if that's you or you know somebody, please uh, come and talk with us. And so there I am over my four minutes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I've got, I've got Dave and I've got Lionel left, who I had asked to speak, and we're, yeah. I want to keep the momentum going. Sorry to you guys, leave you at the end. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Dave Chapman. Is this working? Okay. Yeah. Um, and I am a farmer. I'm a healthcare professional um, for many years. And uh, honestly, I barely left the farm for about 25 years. And about four or five years ago, I discovered I, I grow greenhouse tomatoes. Um, organic and I now have to say in the soil um, because just being organic no longer means it's in the soil. And I discovered that this was happening about five years ago and I said, that's not organic and I got excited about it. And I hadn't gotten that memo from Buckminster Fuller so I <laughs> dove in to fight the National Organic Program. And I, <laughs> I spent the last four years doing that. and. We were successful at making a big fuss. Um, and, you know, some of you here have been at the rallies. There were 15 rallies this year across the country um, protesting the National Organic Program standards. And uh, particularly the, there was a vote this fall in Jacksonville about the hydroponic issue. And uh, we brought some of the great organic pioneers to Jacksonville and had a rally there, and it was very exciting. And there are some things I learned from all this, um, and one of them was that um, what Dan said is true about what happens when you till the soil, and that reconnection is important. And what I discovered as I started to talk to a lot of people about this 
is that they felt uh, very isolated and depressed and defeated. Um, they felt that they'd lost something that was really precious and important to them, and they had no idea how to get it back. And what's happened since then is we still don't have any idea how to get it back, but we're not so isolated and we're not so depressed and we're not so defeated. Another thing that happened is that um, people in the beginning asked me a lot, well, why is soil important? Why is that important to organic? And to be honest, I didn't have a great answer. I went, well, that's what organic is. And that wasn't a great answer. And so uh, I was on a task force, and I had lots of opportunities to pursue this. And I ended up talking to a lot of soil scientists and um, started to get off the farm and come to things like this. And um, I came to this because of, obviously, the exciting group of people who are speaking. Um, i say one last thing, which is that I really don't know what to do. I, th I think that we're at the point with a national organic program where a divorce proceedings are underway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, but that doesn't mean that the organic movement is in any way done. It just means that we're done hanging out with the national organic program, which is a totally separate thing. Yeah. So I think this is part of what happens next, and I'm excited about it. And the one thing I would say, I, I, I love the gizmo, and I'm really looking forward to it, but I think that we're dealing with really complicated things. I've come to appreciate in the last four years just how complicated it all is. And there are a lot of economic forces that really mold what our choices are. What, what is it you get to aim your, your gizmo at in the store? Um, and right now there's going to be less and less food that that gizmo is going to give a great answer about. So it's a big conversation. It's, it's, and this is part of the answer. It won't be the whole answer. Okay, thank you. I guess I'm the mop up. Um, <laughs> clean up. The clean up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I'm Lionel Chute. Uh, the uh, I, I uh, I'm the district manager for Sullivan County in New Hampshire, uh, for the conservation district. Um, how many of you are familiar with conservation districts? Yeah, yeah. They're uh, really well kept secret. Um, <laughs> they're they're. They're important, though. It's, it's um, kind of interesting. They started uh, as a result of the Dust Bowl, and the Dust Bowl really freaked people out, and the timing was just right, came right into Washington, D.C., when they were talking about what, what are we going to do about that Dust Bowl over in Oklahoma. Well, the big black cloud came over D.C. just as they were talking about it. So things happened. And uh, what they did was they created two organizations, the Soil Conservation Service, which became NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service. That's the federal level. But they, in their wisdom at the time, they understood that just setting up another federal program wasn't going to go anywhere. So they also created a local manifestation of that, which are the conservation districts. And there are 3,000 of them in, in the nation. Uh, and some of them are really, really powerful, like the ones out in the Midwest and stuff. The ones in New England, not so much. Um, and part of that is because the, uh, the emphasis for uh, the program has always been on soil conservation, on preventing uh, erosion and protecting water quality. Not very exciting and, and very tough to sell. And when you actually get down in the trenches and you start talking to farmers about erod erosive practices, um, or things that they're doing that's making the water turn brown when it rains. Um, there's re there's, there are reasons for that. Um, financial reasons, energy, energetic reasons, is, you know, how much time they've got to deal with any of it. So, um, so it's, a challenging, uh, it's a challenging pursuit uh, to, to work for a conservation district. And, uh, and, and we're trying to be innovative, we're trying to be relevant. Um, and, I, and I tell you all of this to say that um, NRCS has definitely moved on to soil health in a big way. And there's a lot of great work going on with that. But so far, they're not going the next step, 
to uh, the food and nutrition. Um, and so that may be an opportunity for the conservation districts um, to maintain its relevance and be a bridge uh, with farmers, have something uh, that's uh, new and important um, to, to share with them. Um, I sent an email out a, a, just before this um, conference to some folks, I don't know if you saw it, uh, but uh, somebody earlier mentioned that apparently the nutritional content of our food has been on the decline. Uh, and, and, um, and, and this person, the mathematician, uh, took, took that on uh, as far as carbon, the impact of elevated carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, uh, and has verified that, indeed, uh, the nutritional content of our food will go down even farther and even faster as carbon dioxide levels increase. And the reason for that is that a plant has, can't make do with everything. And when all that additional carbon comes in, you know the climate change deniers love to say that carbon is a food, it's a plant nutrient. Well, plants can't really take it. They have, they're a fixed system. So if they're going to deal with that additional carbon, it's, they're finding it's going to be at the expense of nutrition. So our food's going to get less and less nutritionally valuable. And we need to know what that is so that we can continue. I want to leave, though, one um, concern that I have, because uh, I, I, I'd be dishonest if I didn't. And that is that um, I am concerned about fairness. Um, I, I, I can afford to buy the best food uh, in, in my local co-op. I can go and I can get organic food and I can stoke up on nutrients as much as possible because I can afford to. But there are millions, perhaps billions of people that cannot. And if, if all this is, if, if all this work and energy results in is a commodification of nutrients such that only the wealthy people will be able to afford the nutrient-dense foods, but we'll still have lots and lots of poor food that will go to Walmart and go to other places where folks who've got to eat are going to, they can fill their bag if they get the crummy carrots um, and they don't really know the piece about nutrition as much, then we haven't really changed anything. So I, I hope that somehow we can share this technology and the ramifications of it with everybody. Yes. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for all of your commentary and um, insight and mostly affirmation. Um, yeah. Uh, we were supposed to be uh, breaking out for, um, for, for breakout groups at 2.30. It's getting on to 3 at this point. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with our board members here, and they've been making some suggestions about how we should um, capture the energy and insight and um, passion in this room. Um, with the, the structure for the rest of the day is uh, formally breakout groups, so giving people a chance to take... Um, what has been shared and uh, digest it and turn it into valuable um, feedback or in engagement. Um, I'm wondering if it might not be a, a exercise that people will be willing to engage in to spend maybe 10 minutes quietly. Um, I see most people have pieces of paper in front of them um, and sort of cogitate on uh, what you see uh, would be valuable, um, who you know that could be helpful, uh, what steps could be engaged? Um, it feels a lot like homework. I know it's much easier to sit and listen than it is to actually think and write. Um, but we did say strategy session, so <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'd like to I'd like to invite people to spend uh, some time thoughtfully and and quietly, if possible, um, really digesting. I, I'm I'm seeing a lot of people taking notes, and I bet there's a bunch of good insight. I know there's a bunch of good insight and a bunch of good introductions and a bunch of good relationships. Um, 